Obviously, The Simpsons and Futurama are two of the most popular cartoons in history, and Matt Groening's two biggest achievements. And as you might expect, when two similar things are popular, some people want those two things to cross over and be one thing for a little while. Well, The Simpsons and Futurama have actually done this on at least two major occasions, with The Simpsons season 26 episode Simpsorama, as well as a four-issue crossover comic book event called The Simpsons Futurama Infinitely Secret Crossover Crisis. Both of these events took their own approaches to combining these two universes, and each has their own sets of pros and cons. So in this video, I want to go over the long history of these two juggernauts referencing one another, and then compare and contrast Simpsorama and Crossover Crisis to determine which medium handled the merging of these universes the best. Let's go already! So the first thing to note is that The Simpsons and Futurama both exist as TV shows in one another's universes. We know that Futurama is a show in The Simpsons. Why did they cancel Futurama? <laughs> And we know that The Simpsons is a show in Futurama. Um, when are you gonna make a second Simpsons movie? <laughs> no! So this means that over the course of their long histories, most references to one another have been as references to a fictional TV show within each respective universe. The Simpsons, having way more episodes, has obviously referenced Futurama many times. There are a handful of relatively major ones too. Bender has appeared numerous times over the show's history. In Missionary Impossible, the episode ends with a Fox telethon taking donations, and Bender is one of the representatives for the Fox series. In Bart vs. Lisa vs. the Third Grade, Bart hallucinates a bunch of TV characters, including including Bender, also a very scary Pikachu. The episode Future Drama features a quick Bender cameo, albeit with weirdly colored limbs. All right, you guys are my new best friends. You wish, loser. <laughs> in Simprovised, they broadcast a segment of the episode live, and during this, Bender walks by with a sign that says, bring back Futurama again. And uh, hey, it worked. And Bender appears in or near The Simpsons basement multiple times after the episode Sinsorama for reasons which I will talk about later. Mac Raining appears at a comic book convention in My Big Fat Geek Wedding. Wow, the creator of Futurama. Mr. Groening, will you autograph my Bender doll? Homar has a couch gag with pneumatic tubes and a yellow skinned fry pops in before being replaced with Bart. Fry makes a couple of other appearances with Leela too. In Beware My Cheating Bart, during a zoom out from Springfield to space, they shoot right past Leela and Fry sitting on an asteroid. And in the most recent season, season 34, Fry and Leela appear as the background of Marge's biking instructor. Though I think my favorites are the quick cameos from Hypnotoad, one in the background of a presidential debate in 2056, and the other in the Guillermo del Toro directed couch gag for Treehouse of Horror 24. There are tons more references to Futurama, but most of them are much smaller. Uder even wore a Futurama shirt and married to the mob three entire months before Futurama premiered. I won't go through the rest of the smaller ones, but you can find them in compilation videos and in lists online. Futurama's list of Simpsons references is obviously much smaller. In the very first episode, Space Pilot 3000, and Fry zooms past a differently colored Blinky here. Bender finds a pile of trashed Bart Simpson dolls and a big piece of garbage. Eat my shorts. Okay. Mmm, shorts. Homer and Bart appear as prizes in a Coney Island flashback in Mars University. The opening cartoon in Fry and the Slurm Factory is an old Tracy Ullman Simpsons short called Making Faces. In Tip of the Zoidberg, Fry contracts Simpsons Jaundice, and that really is just the tip of the Zoidberg. These shows reference each other a lot, which makes sense. They share a creator and lots of writers and staff members, which came to a head in season 26's Simpsorama, which aired about a year after Futurama's latest series finale, which will soon no longer be its actual series finale. What a world. The episode is written by J. Stewart Burns, who wrote on both series, so he was a natural fit for the episode. But I've always felt that this episode felt a lot more like an extended Treehouse of Horror segment than like a regular episode of The Simpsons. And honestly, I think that's the best way to look at it. It doesn't really make sense given that we know The Simpsons and Futurama are both TV series in the opposite's respective universes. So to canonically tie the future of Futurama to the present of The Simpsons gets a little messy. As it is a Simpsons episode, it begins in Springfield as Bart's class is putting items into their time capsule. Having forgotten something, Bart grabs the sandwich he brought for lunch, blows his nose in it before dropping it in the capsule. I always thought this was very gross, but I did get a kick out of this tag to the gag. <gasps> My sandwich! Eventually, during a storm, Bender sort of falls from the sky and starts stealing beer from the Simpsons' basement, only to be discovered by Bart and Homer. This might be me being a little bit of a Futurama snob, but I thought Bender opening with Bite My Shiny Metal Ass was kinda weak. He says it after being hit to the ground by a broom, and it just sort of feels like, okay, let's open with the catchphrase. But it didn't really feel like a natural response to being attacked, to me at least. 
But Bender and Homer become fast friends, which is a really fun sequence in the episode. Homer even brings him to Moe's and he hangs out with the entire gang. They have some really touching and funny moments together here too. I know you're a robot and incapable of emotion. <laughs> it's true. He gets along with all of them. They go bowling together. They have a great time. Bender and Homer are a natural pairing. It makes sense that they get along so well and they're really fun whenever they're on screen together. I also really enjoyed this little gag about how they look alike. A little lazy, if you ask me. It's an easy joke, but it's their first time hanging on screen together. I'm glad they acknowledged it. The first act ends with Professor Frank resetting Bender, helping him realize what his mission was all along, to kill Homer Simpson. <laughs> what an ironic twist of fate. This is when the rest of the Planet Express crew enters the picture, checking back in on Bender to see if he's carried out the mission. The problem being that these little rabbit gremlins are running wild in New New York, and they somehow contain Homer's DNA. Making these monsters rabbits is another great touch, given that Graining got his start with his rabbit starring comic strip Life in Hell. The professor, Leela, and Fry get transported through a portal inside Bender and arrive in Springfield, setting up the second act. Farnsworth, Frank, and Lisa all try to figure out a solution to the rabbit problem, while Fry and Leela go with the rest of the family to explore Springfield. Explore this time period. Find out why people would ever pay for freemium games. Damn, that's, uh, that's a good question, Prof- Futurama, Worlds of Tomorrow. Alright, moving on. Pairing Frank and Lisa with Farnsworth is a natural fit. It sets up some really funny moments, especially when Lisa asks about how they even got there. Was it a time machine? Little girl, time machines are physical impossibilities. Oh, are they, Professor? Time machines are impossible? Really impossible, you say? How did Bender get here? With a time machine. All right, moving on. Well, I think this pairing worked well, it does feel like they didn't have quite enough for the rest of the gang to do in Springfield. There's a fun moment where Leela and Marge are anxious about accidentally mentioning each other's eye and hair, respectively. But other than that, they kind of just walk through Springfield back to the Simpsons' house. And of course, they have to kick us in the heart one last time by showing Fry walk past Seymour, which again, makes zero sense geographically chronologically, regular logically. It's just a cheap jab in the heart. Eventually, they figure out the rabbit spawned from Bart's disgusting time capsule sandwich, mostly because they transform into these little gremlins that look exactly like Bart. The Planet Express crew and Simpsons get sucked back through Bender, and the final act is spent dealing with the gremlin problem in New New York, while Bender takes Maggie to the horse track. And I did enjoy that brief scene. This was a great joke. Chief, it looks like a robot killing horses over there. Ah, oh, 608. You, can't you just let me enjoy my day off? I appreciate that the episode spends an act with the Futurama gang in Springfield, and another act with the Simpsons in New New York, but it does feel like they don't quite get to explore either location enough. It really seems like this should have been a two-parter or a double-length episode, kind of like the Simpsons Family Guy crossover, just to give enough time to really explore the possibilities of each location. It makes the resolution happen really fast, and while I do like the detail that Lisa helps corral the gremlins with a saxophone version of the holophoner, it doesn't feel like we spend enough time in the Futurama world. We don't really get to see the Simpsons' real reactions to that world, but I do think the ending kind of just makes it all worth it. After they return to Spring field, the only person who can't return to the future through Bender is obviously Bender, so he turns himself off and the Simpsons keep him in their basement. There's this lovely little moment where Homer pours beer into Bender's head and Bender thanks him, which I always saw as this sweet little send-off from the Simpsons to Futurama. Hey, we know your show's going into hibernation, but we'll make sure your corpse has a nice spot in the basement until it resurrects. And sure enough, we're just months away from the first new Futurama in 10 years. <sighs> I've always said I overall enjoyed Simpsorama. It feels a bit rushed, and looking back, I do wish they had given it an additional episode to really breathe, but the charm of seeing these characters meet was enough for me. I found the episode relatively funny, and looking at it from a non-canonical perspective just allowed me to enjoy it like I do any What If Machine or Treehouse of Horror episode. Though obviously, with Bender's corpse making occasional appearances in The Simpsons' basement still, it's technically got canonical aspects for The Simpsons. But while I didn't think it held up to the best of Futurama, it certainly was one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons from that particular era. As I mentioned up top, this wasn't actually the first time The Simpsons and Futurama crossed over. In 2002, a comic book team-up called Futurama Simpsons Infinitely Secret Crossover Crisis was released as a two-issue event. Then, in 2005, there was a follow-up called The Simpsons Futurama Crossover Crisis 2. I actually read these for the first time recently, and my friend Tunerific Tariq has always sworn that they are much better than The Simpsorama event. Hey, it's true! So, after reading all four issues, did I think it was better? 
Yeah, in some ways, but definitely not in every way. On paper, the premise for Crossover Crisis is much stronger than for Simsurama. Basically, the premise of the first event involves the Brain Spawn, who use their abilities to trap the Planet Express crew inside a Simpsons comic, just like we saw them do with books in The Day the Earth Stood Stupid. And like I said, I love this premise. It maintains the idea that the Simpsons are fictional in the Futurama universe, and it uses that previously established lore from The Day the Earth Stood Stupid to cross over the characters. It is fundamentally a stronger plot. This story is also very clearly commenting on comic books in general, particularly the collector's market. The premise involves the brain spawn sealing the Simpsons comic in liquid diamond to maintain its mint condition, trapping the Futurama characters inside. A funny idea that also sorta of takes the piss out of graded comic book collecting, a form of collecting that prevents you from reading your comic at all. And Crossover Crisis does a mostly great job pairing up Futurama and Simpsons characters and giving them real time to interact, where Simsorama mostly just gave us Bender slash Homer and and Lisa slash Farnsworth. Fry becomes Bart's substitute teacher, Lisa and Leela connect a bit, Nibbler hypnotizes Marge into thinking he's another cute baby, we even see some funny smaller pair-ups like Smithers and Hermes, Burns makes Zoidberg his personal doctor for some reason, and there's a quick little panel with Scruffy and Willy hanging out too. Weirdly enough, there are actually a few really specific things that both Crossover Crisis and Simsorama did separately. Some are obvious, but some are super specific. Homer and Bender pairing up is obvious, but both the comic and the Simpsons episode have have them really connect and bond at Moe's. Although Moe does kick Bender out in the crossover crisis, which is a funny juxtaposition with his attitude in Simsorama. In both of them, Leela wears sunglasses to hide her eye, though I guess that was actually first seen in Roswell that ends well. The resolution to both the first crossover crisis event and Simsorama involves Lisa tricking somebody with a holophoner, but absolutely most bizarrely, without question, is that both involve Bender banging a jukebox. Bender briefly stays at Flanders in the crossover crisis, and Flanders catches him in the act doing something with his jukebox. And here's a line in Simsurama. Plus he fixed the jukebox. I think they had a thing going. Oh baby, what you done to me? The first crossover crisis ends with Farnsworth using a doomsday device that tears open the fabric of comic book reality, thus the comic book is no longer in mint condition and is immediately removed from its casing, freeing the Planet Express crew. But it ends on a cliffhanger as upon returning to New York, the city is mysteriously overrun with Simpsons characters. Overall, there is a ton to love about the first two issue event. It pairs the characters really well, gives us a fun look at what would happen if the entire Planet Express crew really spent time in Springfield, and it also just beautifully incorporates Futurama lore into its main premise. But it also suffers from some meandering story issues and contrived plot points that did turn me off a little bit, especially towards the end. There's an entire sequence where the combined gangs just end up in the Simpsons flying car thanks to some anti-gravity gum that Fry has. It just feels very removed from the story. It kind of felt like they just needed a big exciting sequence towards the end that felt far more like a tangent than a core part of the plot. And it ends conveniently with Farnsworth and Frank catching the car with like a big magnet. I don't know. There's also this weird plot point where it turns out that Smithers had actually been Amy in disguise the entire time, which fully felt like a cop-out to explain where the heck Amy had been the entire issue. It makes absolutely none of Smithers' other actions prior to this in the comic make any sense. But it was still, overall, a very fun time with lots to love. And where Crossover Crisis 1 spent its time in Springfield, Crossover Crisis 2 moves the Simpsons characters to New New York. But it also reframes the cliffhanger from the first event, basically retconning it into something that Farnsworth has now made happen Happen, inventing a pair of scissors that cut the characters right out of their fictional reality and bring them into the real world. It also reframes the event to take place in 3005 rather than right after the first event in 3002. So once again the Simpsons characters are comic book variants, but this time they've been brought to life and bizarrely Farnsworth suggests that they all be used as slave labor since fix as they call them are not real people quite a premise. They once again jump around showcasing character pairings, with Simpsons characters being enslaved by their parallel Futurama counterparts. Fat Tony is working for the Donbot, Moe is working for Isaac, though I have to play my comic book guy card here because this panel labels the pub as Zorgnax's pub, but in the series it's actually Ozorgnax's pub. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. They also pair Mom and Burns, and they actually fall in love, which is a plot point I actually kind of like. But I did feel like they didn't actually do much with this premise, because while we got to see some of these fun pairings, for the remainder of the issue, the Simpsons just kind of go on random deliveries with the Planet Express crew, which is honestly something I did want to see, 
complete, it just felt like it was fully ignoring the premise that had been set up. The deliveries were kind of fun, each one parodying a famous sci-fi movie, first Empire Strikes Back, then Aliens, and finally 2001 A Space Odyssey, and then before they even really get a chance to explore more with the plot of the Simpsons characters being slaves in the Futurama world, they introduce the cliffhang twist leading into the final issue. Bender tosses Farnsworth magic scissors towards the library, unleashing every fictional character in history on New New York. The final issue mostly revolves around the Simpsons and the Planet Express gang trying to figure out how to fight back against the fictional characters who have now taken over the city. And there are some very fun scenes and ideas, characters chased by the entire works of Stephen King, these kids from Hop on Pop popping on Homer. It's so tragic the way they hopped on Pop. There's also a fun superhero gag where a gang of Marvel and DC superheroes show up, but mostly obscured by shadows for copyright protection. It ends with the Marvel and DC heroes fighting each other, not unlike the DC vs Marvel crossover comic event from the 90s. 90s, a fun thing to allude to in this crossover comic event. And while I did feel like the Planet Express crew sort of disappeared for a bit too long in this final issue, there was a very fun resolution from The Simpsons. They used the what-if machine to ask for a way to solve the problem, which leads to Bart finding a copy of the very first Simpsons comic in Fry's collection. He tosses the colossal Homer page into the vortex, unleashing giant Homer on New New York and driving back all of the other fictional characters. This actually was the premise of the very first Simpsons comic book story, so that is a really fun way to incorporate incorporate the series history into this comic. Interestingly, the end of this event doesn't actually see the Simpsons return to their comic. They go on a delivery with the Planet Express crew, and the issue ends on another cliffhanger setup, showing that Mom saved some of Burn's DNA and is cloning him after he returned to the comic book. As far as I know, this cliffhanger has never been followed up. The Crossover Crisis 2 event does have some really fun stuff in it, though I would argue that it maybe suffers from straying a bit too far away from the premise of crossing over the Simpsons in Futurama. The entire second issue is primarily spent showing the Simpsons fight off a bunch of fictional characters. It just happens to take place in New New York. It just ends up feeling quite a bit removed from the conceit of the crossover. But again, still tons of fun to be had and lots of quality moments between characters. The issue I had with Simpsorama not having enough time to explore the possibilities of the team up is pretty firmly not the issue with Crossover Crisis. By having the first event set entirely in Springfield inside the comic book and the second event set entirely in New New York with the Simpsons characters invading, two full comic book issues were spent in each location. However, while I would say the first event mostly used its time in Springfield effectively, I think the second event may have squandered some of its time in New New York. And while I don't necessarily count this against them, the comic book stories are... Well, they're very comic booky, which, yeah, I get it, they should be, but a lot of the stuff we see in those issues do not feel like something we would want to see in a TV episode of Futurama or The Simpsons. Other than the initial premise of the first crossover crisis, I would have actually loved to see a Futurama episode where the brain spawn just straight up stick the Planet Express gang right into an episode of The Simpsons. That could have worked really well, and prevented the wonky continuity issues we got from the more straightforward Simpsorama crossover. So, which event do I think is better? Well, honestly, I guess that just depends on what you're looking for. I still think Simpsorama delivers some really funny moments and some quality crossover time between the gangs, even if I think that they maybe could have used more time to really explore the premise properly and get the most out of it. Crossover Crisis spends way more time exploring the possibilities of these crossovers, but maybe strays too far from its premise with meandering comic booky plot lines. And you know, Simpsorama certainly has the advantage of actually being animated and having the casts of both series performing the characters. But overall, I think both Simpsorama and Crossover Crisis are very solid Simpsons x Futurama crossovers, each with their own pros and cons, and neither fully delivering on a perfect crossover experience. But who knows though, now with Futurama coming back, and all three of Graining series about to be airing simultaneously, it's possible we could get one last crack at some kind of big, massive, giant crossover event. Oh, a man can dream though. A man can dream. Alright, moving on. Johnny! Two challenge!